Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, the managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to discuss a really cool little list that Steam has put together of the highest grossing games on their platform, which if you're not familiar is a personal computer PC only. So we can actually take quite a lot out of the list that they've put together, which isn't ordered, so it creates a little bit more opacity than we might like. But we can take a lot out of what is on that list, what isn't on that list, and we can start to see certain trends in the industry. Certainly we can start to see what kind of business model Steam is looking at, what they're dealing with, with respect to the other developers and publishers that maybe want to use the Steam platform, maybe don't want to use the Steam platform. And we can really take the that list and some of the other information that I've got here that I want to discuss and start to get a more holistic picture of what's happening in the industry, what business models are working, what maybe aren't working as well, uh, what trends are being followed, and really start to understand why we're seeing what we're seeing with the Epic Game Store coming out and its different distributor uh, and developer relationship. And the same thing goes for the, the Discord Store, which is also trying to change the, the, the content provider uh, split as between the developer uh, and, and the network servicing. And so I, I think without further ado, uh, we'll just dive into that because I think there are a lot of interesting things to take a look at. And as you know, if you followed my channel or, or listened to any of uh, my thoughts on the subject, either on this or on movie or on sports, I like to read between the lines. I like to look at what we can see, what, what's kind of the tip of the iceberg that's above the waterline, and really kind of try to interpret that and deduce and, and speculate, sure, but really kind of look at what we can't see and try to figure out what these corporate actors, what these businesses that that really are the functional uh, gatekeepers behind what we get to see, what we get as consumers and what we don't, uh, and really analyze what it is that they're looking at. Uh, and I think this list uh, is very informative of that topic. So let's take a look. Uh, so here you can see here uh, here's the Steam page, best of 2018 top sellers. A couple of important notes on this. Uh, this is by gross revenue. So you'll see here on the top list that there are uh, three, I believe, free-to-play games out of the top 12, which is, of course, uh, really interesting. Anybody that follows the industry or that plays these games knows quite well how much money they can extract from your pocket, how enticing they can make that voice pack or that skin or that gun or whatever it is that they're selling to you. And you can see that that model is very, very, very successful uh, for a lot of these games. Uh, interestingly enough, Warframe, uh, which is an older game and maybe doesn't get as much publicity as some others, has really made strides uh, in this area over the over the past few years uh, in being a very high grossing product. And so it's it's not a surprise that it's on the top of this list, except for the fact that it doesn't quite get the coverage that some of these other games do. It certainly doesn't get the kind of AAA marketing push that some of these other games do. Um, and I personally have only jumped in on it uh, a little bit, only really touched the surface. It seems like a quality game, a fun experience. Um, but uh, it clearly makes a lot of money. Uh, so good for them. Uh, but it is... As always, important to note, free to play obviously doesn't mean free uh, if you want to uh, potentially fully enjoy the experience. Um, for the most part, I think the industry has moved away from uh, monetization models that uh, have been derided as pay to win, sometimes unfairly so, but they've really kind of moved towards only cosmetic items or, or items that don't directly impact your conflict with another player or your ability to gain resources or things of that nature. Um, so you see those three games here. Uh, Counter-Strike, Danger Zone, uh, Dota 2, uh, and Warframe, all being free-to-play, but still appearing as one of the top 12 grossing games on Steam this year. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing that jumped out at me when I looked at this list, and, and again, this list isn't ordered. If you actually refresh this page a number of times, it'll change where the boxes are. So they've divided these into tiers. They've got platinum and gold and silver and bronze, and they don't really demarcate what the revenue numbers are for those, uh, but we can uh, assume that platinum is higher than gold, is higher than silver, is higher than bronze. So the platinum games are doing quite well for themselves. So the other thing that really jumped out at me here is that of the primarily single-player games, um, Far Cry 5 and Assassin's Creed Odyssey appear on this list, which is fascinating to me uh, because uh, although Assassin's Creed Odyssey, if you saw my game series, is my personal game of the year, you don't usually hear 
the Ubisoft games talked about that often in kind of the heightened uh, tones of uh, really fantastic game debates. You know, it's not God of War. Uh, it's not Spider-Man. It's not Red Dead Redemption 2. Far Cry 5 is a game uh, that I think released in March of this year. Uh, was perfectly enjoyable, uh, pretty much it does what it says on the tin. It's the fifth Far Cry, and it feels like it, uh, but it's fun, and it just goes away. You don't really hear about it very much uh, more, but it turns out when you look at the end of these year uh, lists, and this happened last year or the year before, excuse me, <coughs> um, when you're looking at things like Ghost Recon Wildlands or For Honor, Ubisoft just continues to crank out games which are very popular even if they aren't talked about on Reset Era or NeoGAF or on uh, GameSpot or IGN very often. It's just people enjoying the games, spending money on the games, potentially buying um, uh, cosmetic items for the games. Both Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Far Cry 5, I believe, support um, add-on buys and things of that nature. So you do have those opportunities to have a long-tail economic gain from them, which can contribute to this gross revenue number. But predominantly, they're single-player games. Unlike kind of the multiplayer games as a service model that we see a lot of other companies adopting. If you recall last year, we heard Electronic Arts come out and basically say that single, they, met, they didn't say single player is dead. They said that the, the industry was moving forward in a, in a multiplayer games as a service model because if you can get a, a critical mass of people to engage with a multiplayer game with a games as a service model, you get a continuing source of revenue forever and ever. Amen versus you sell God of War, everybody loves God of War, it doesn't have microtransactions, it doesn't have cosmetics to sell, it's not going to appear on a high-grossing list if one existed uh, in this capacity for just Sony PlayStation uh, in a couple years' time. It's not the same kind of model, so you spend all that money, you don't have that long tail, and the electronic artses of the world look at that and say, well, maybe there's a better way to spend our resources. And they may not be wrong, but this list certainly shows there are games that are predominantly single player that are having success. Um, the other thing that, that jumped out at me is there are a fair number of long tail games on here, meaning that they're games that are older. They didn't release in 2018. They released before then. Um, so you see Civilization VI. You see Grand Theft Auto V. You see Elder Scrolls Online. And you see these games, and they have um, either components that are expansion-based or uh, online-based Grand Theft Auto V is essentially what I usually describe it as a single-player campaign that released in 2015, but with a free-to-play uh, game very similar to a Warframe uh, or uh, a um, uh, well, what, what's now Red Dead Redemption 2 online uh, or a, a Fortnite Save the World or any other kind of free-to-play game that uh, has this kind of cosmetic, you buy apartments, you buy cars, whatever it is, and you can spend money in the real world to kind of advance your online character within that framework. So Grand Theft Auto V has been on this list and lists like it uh, for as long as I can remember. It's one of the highest selling games of all time. It's been on these lists forever. It makes all this money, yes, in selling the base game, but also a lot in selling their premium currency to buy those apartments, to buy those penthouses, to buy those cars. And so that's the model you see so many of these publishers looking at and saying, okay, if we can have a Grand Theft Auto V online, uh, or if we could have a Warframe, maybe even a Warframe type game that we sell for 20 bucks up front, or, or 60 bucks in an ideal world for them, then that's where the money really lives. That's how you get on this list. That's how you stay on this list. That's why Grand Theft Auto V has been on this list for a long time. Versus we wouldn't expect to see Far Cry 5 and Assassin's Creed Odyssey in this spot next year. Uh, but hey, I could be wrong, uh, but certainly the publishers look at it and say, hmm, maybe that's not going to be uh, where we make the most money, uh, and we'd rather look for those long tails. Uh, and we talked about it a lot on uh, questions answered to the, the Easy Allies on the Help Us Out Hogue segments of their podcast, but that's really what I mean when I talk about trying to analyze corporations' actions under the rubric of fiduciary duty, which is this concept that the, the officers and the directors of a corporation are the guardians of other people's money that have been put into their company. And they have to analyze the markets that they're looking at. They have to analyze the products that they're making, the services that they're rendering, and try to figure out what is the best return on the investment that they can make. If they spend a million dollars over here and they can get an Assassin's Creed Odyssey sales out of it 
that's great. That's a top grossing game of the year. But if they can get three Assassin's Creed Odysseys out of it, which is the hope and the ideal and the dream for some of these publishers and, and, and business in general, then that would be a better return on investment. And that's why you see last year you saw Electronic Arts put loot boxes into absolutely everything because they looked at Overwatch, they looked at some other places, they looked at mobile games and saw that people were investing all this money in loot boxes, that there must be all this money there and it wouldn't cost them any critical acclaim, it wouldn't cost them any frontline sales to put those in. And that was what they believed was the best move to making the most money for their company. Now, they were wrong. That doesn't mean they breached a duty. That means they made a mistake. Uh, you, you saw all the backlash to the loot boxes in Battlefront. You saw all the backlash to the loot boxes put into Need for Speed. And you get into these kind of debates uh, with people that are interesting. And they're fun debates, as long as everybody's respectful. Reasonable disagreement is, is the spice of life. Um, and you can have these debates about whether they're making a good decision or whether they're making a bad decision. When an EA comes out and says hey, we think games as a service is the future. Is that right or wrong? Sony comes out and says, hey, we've got Marvel Spider-Man. Hey, we've got God of War. At some point in the future, we've got Death Stranding and Ghost of Tsushima and a bunch of other stuff that appear to be primarily single-player games. Lord only knows with Death Stranding. Um, but they say, hey, we think that um, much like a, a, an Oscar-fronting movie for a movie studio, we think those single-player, high-resource, quadruple-A-type development titles are important to our brand and they help bring everybody into the ecosystem. I tend to agree with that approach. I think that electronic arts tends to stretch things too far and have to walk things back. But you see that with Activision. You see that with electronic arts. I'm not trying to single them out. I'm just trying to give a little flavor for what the fiduciary duty kind of concept means because we're also going to talk about what it means for Steam. Um, because you see Ubisoft here. What don't you see here? You don't see Call of Duty here, which is one of the highest selling games of the year because it's over on... Uh, Battle.net. It's on Activision's own server. What else don't you see? You don't see Battlefield 5 here um, or Electronic Arts games in general. Why don't you see those? You see those because they're on Origin. You don't see Fallout 76 here, which uh, a number of you might be happy about and I can't really blame you for based on the reviews. I can't honestly say that I've played it myself. A multiplayer Fallout game never sounded like it, something that was attractive to me, but it certainly could have been good uh, and I, it's a shame that I'm, not, I'm hearing that it's not as good as it could be for the folks that would like that experience. But you don't see it on this store because it's over on Bethesda Online. And this all tells a part of a story. Because what have we seen this year? We saw in late November, we saw the Steam store come out and say, hey, uh, we've heard you. We know you're upset uh, about 70-30 splits. Uh, what we've agreed to do is the more you sell, the lower that split gets. So if you make X amount of dollars, we're going to lower that to 75-25. You make X amount more, we're going to lower it to 80-20. And why did they do that? And there was a lot of talk about that in the business side of things, about how they needed to keep the big guns at the store because they were looking at these other alternatives. You've got Battle.net that can get you Destiny, that can get you Call of Duty over there. You've got Origin that can get you EA games that you're interested in, like Battlefield Five over there. Bethesda wants to build their own thing for Fallout 76. And you look at this list and you see Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Far Cry 5 are right at the top with Ubisoft. And Ubisoft has done their own kind of Uplay thing in the past. But if they ever really decided to put their resources in it, these are major, major players for Steam to lose money on. And so they want to say, okay, all right. Um, yes, you can go build your own thing, but that's a lot of trouble. You've got logistical hassles. You've got a lot of places where you could lose money. We hear you. We don't think, you don't think we're necessarily earning our 30%. I tell you what, if you make enough money, you can lower that. If, you make, if you're hugely successful like an Assassin's Creed Odyssey or a Far Cry 5, we'll lower that cut even more. You get to stay in our ecosystem with our 100 million users, uh, but we understand and we don't want you to leave. So Valve, who runs Steam, is having their own fiduciary kind of conversation. Now, Gabe Newell owns a majority share of the company, um, but he doesn't own the whole thing. The best I could tell, I could only find articles that show he owns more than half, so he owns a controlling interest in the company. But even though it's a close corporation, meaning it's not publicly traded, it's not anything we can have access to full information on, and it's not something that they have to file uh, federal paperwork to show ownership or to show changes or to show contracts in, it doesn't change the fact that Mr. Newell is still a fiduciary for the money of the other investors that have invested money in the company. So even if he owns... 90% of the company, then the 10% of investors that have given the money to him, he still has to try to 
uh, maximize their return on investment as much as possible under the the corporate law statutes of, uh, I believe it's in Washington uh, where Valve is located. And so you've got these kinds of situations where he sees EA leaving, he sees Activision and Blizzard leaving, he sees Bethesda leaving, and they have to have that kind of communication in late November that says, okay, uh, we need to try to hold Ubisoft because if they leave, that's a real bad thing, and we need to try to hold our real big winners um, to, to so that they stay in the ecosystem, 70-30, um, and then and down to 2080. But Epic Games has Fortnite, and that's the other major game you don't see on here, and that's a free-to-play game that's on the Epic Games Store, it was also essentially uh, available uh, through the Fortnite website before that, and it's one of the biggest stories of the year. It's one of the biggest games of the year. It doesn't appear here. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds does appear here as the kind of battle royale representative in the Steam ecosystem, but Fortnite isn't here. And all that money that Fortnite made to Epic gave them the leeway to say, "Hey, uh, not only is seventy thirty not fair, we don't think it's fair for anybody, and we think we can get you a better deal." And so we're going to toss all this money that we're making in Fortnite and we're going to toss it at developers. We're going to offer them an 88-12 cut. And then they've also taken the step of buying exclusive games away from Steam. Some that were already announced on Steam, some that had yet to be announced as games or that had yet to come out on Steam either in early access or otherwise. And there's been a lot of conversation around the industry about whether or not that's a good move. Uh, And certainly there's a lot of folks, I think, that rightly think that's a bit distasteful at bare minimum, which is to say, uh, if I want to buy my games on Steam, I should be able to. And the fact that you've got a $10 million satchel of money to hand over to developer X to make sure that their game doesn't release on Steam isn't really helping anybody except uh, you uh, and potentially that developer who gets the satchel of money and gets the higher cut. Uh, but it doesn't help me as a consumer because you've just taken it away from my preferred ecosystem with the forums that I like or with the library that I like, and you've just spent a lot of money to deny me an option in the marketplace. And I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that argument, but certainly from the Epic side of things, they're looking at it and saying, okay, Steam has 100 million eyeballs. We need to get more. We need to figure out a way to bring them over. Uh, And so we're going to essentially make exclusive a number of games that people would naturally be interested in so that at least at the start of this Epic Games Store thing, we've got people remembering that our website exists. We've got people remembering to come check us out. And hopefully my my thought process has to be the long-term business model is not to spend exorbitant amounts of money on exclusives for the long term. But once you get to a critical mass of people remembering that you exist, that it snowballs and that you become a legitimate competitor to Steam. Now, you can check out my other videos on the Epic Game Store and Steam in particular to talk about how I think it would probably be better to subsidize and incentivize uh, lower costs just across the board on the Epic Game Store with that 18% difference in the developer cut in a manner similar to, to the Walmarts or the discount stores of the world where you can just say, hey, that thing that is X dollars over there, it's X minus $2 over here. And if you do that for everything and consistently, you get people to remember that you exist solely by virtue of, hey, I can save a little bit of money if I go to that store and kind of naturally build your audience in a way that doesn't offend the consumers of this marketplace, the PC gaming digital marketplace that you want to sell to. Um, but you don't see those games you don't see the Epic Games here. You don't see Bethesda. You don't see EA. You don't see Activision. And that's been happening more and more and more as Steam has gone on. Uh, so that does tell a story about how these interactions are happening, how Epic sees a chance to seize control, what Steam is dealing with when they talk about um, people leaving and when they talk about changing their own 70-30 split to try to get people to stay. The fact that they're looking at two different Ubisoft titles in their top 12 and that that has been a consistent presence in their top grossing games for a long time. So they got to keep Ubisoft happy, as well as these other big uh, makers of of video games uh, happy. Uh, And that's an interesting part of the story. Uh, The other interesting part of the story is is that, obviously, Steam is not consoles, and you can see uh, in the NPDs, uh, which I've also got here, hang on, uh, that the, the bulk of the games that the NPD identifies as... Uh, the top sellers for the last couple months don't appear on that Steam list uh, because they're console exclusive, because they're on that uh, list of games that aren't appearing on Steam because of the reasons we talked about. And that's another issue to consider. So you've got Red Dead Redemption 2, which is a top seller, which is expected, although it outselling Call of Duty Black Ops 4 is, is quite the 
quite the move, even for a Rockstar game. Call of Duty has that kind of position in in the game sphere that that's a bit of a surprise, um, but I think a justifiable one. I think Red Dead Redemption 2 is a, a good game. Uh, then you've got Battlefield 5, not on Steam. You've got Fallout 76, not on Steam. You've got the two Pokemon games, uh, which are impressive as holding two different slots for Nintendo, uh, in uh, not on Steam. Uh, you've got NBA 2K19, uh, which I'm not sure of, of whether or not it's on Steam. Madden NFL 19 is not on Steam. Spyro is not on Steam. And, and FIFA 19 is not on Steam. That's just November. Uh, so you've got these. Uh, you've you've got these things to consider uh, if you're Steam and if you're Valve of the console space moving away from you, but also the fact that the the major third party players in the console space are moving away from you. And to maintain your market position is not something that you can uh, just ignore. You can't you can't sit on your laurels if you're Valve and simply assume that because you've got this market dominant position that nothing is ever going to change. You, you might be the only place to buy digital games right now, but if there is that ability to make money and lower those percentages, as Epic suggests, there are always going to be players that try to move in on your turf. And it's taken a while for somebody to decide to do that. And it's taken really Fortnite to give Epic that much money on Discord uh, time in order to get a essentially a user base that was big enough where they thought they could pull it off without any other kind of Fortnite backing or anything like that um, to really bring this all to a head. But 2019 is going to be an absolutely fascinating year for this. And this is all things that you can see essentially just by taking a really careful look at these various lists and looking at them and, and, and looking at what Steam's showing you and looking what the NPD is showing you and looking what at, at what's happening to the game store situation and what the contracts are going to be in the future between Steam games that are available and between Discord games that are available and between Epic games that are available and whether or not you have these provisions that are going to prevent them from appearing at different prices or at all on the different stores is going to be a continuing fascinating story of a kind of virtual legality type that I hope to follow in 2019. Um, so with that all being said, <coughs> that's how uh, uh, Richard Hogue of Hogue Law looks at a thing as simple as 12 pictures of video game covers on a, on a Steam list when he sees them come out this morning. Um, so that's a that's a brief insight to how I look at these things, but I do think it's a lot of fun to look at these things, to think about the fiduciary responsibilities of the various entities involved, and to go from there. Uh, so uh, with that all being said, uh, as is uh, a phrase I like to use, um, I think that's probably going to be my last virtual legality of the year. I thank you very much. Those of you who have joined me for previous videos, uh, I have a, a number of them that have proven to be uh, fairly uh, popular amongst people that are looking at the legal issues that are related to the video game industry as of right now. Certainly there's the epic lawsuit and the rapping, uh, the, the rapper dancers that are uh, suing Epic for using their dances in Fortnite. There is the, the Raimi suit and the Marvel Spider-Man game on the PlayStation that finally did get in. Uh, but that I talked about extensively about what intellectual property rights are really between all the various studios and why that could have been held up for as long as it was, uh, and some other topics that are a lot of fun. Um, so if you do like this, my intent is to have virtual legality episodes at least once a week. I think I've been averaging about three a week until this holiday week uh, happened. Um, so I do like doing these. I do like talking about the industry and business in general. Uh, and I do hope to uh, to branch out into things that are just outside of video games, some more software, some more information technology. We've got CES coming up in January. So if you do like those, uh, please do drop by. Please do subscribe. I intend to keep doing this uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and hopefully you find them as enjoyable as I find making them. So thanks again for watching. Uh, and uh, please check in on the channel from time to time.